I wanted it to look like how it feels like and how it feels to be Irish sometimes is that you are in a murder mystery. This is the Listening Books Podcast, a show for every kind of reader and especially for fans of audiobooks. Today I'm sharing a conversation with best-selling author and popular podcaster Carolyn O'Donoghue. And thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, I was introduced to your work actually through your podcast um, rather than your books at first. A friend of mine was telling me that I had to listen to Sentimental Garbage. Um, and I did. And it was so warm and funny and insightful. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. Um, that's, I, I love to hear that, actually, because that is a common... I hear that quite a lot in that people hear th- of me through the podcast first and then they buy my books and, you know, then everyone's happy. Um, and what's great about that is it, like, because podcasts, you know, really don't make very much money at all, um, what they are is, like, sort of you know, they're, they're a labor of love for doing the thing, but they're also an exercise in kind of reputation building. Um, and sometimes when I'm like at my desk at one in the morning, like editing a show about a book that came out 30 years ago, that is mostly out of print. I like, I, I literally ask myself, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why <laughs> you have so many things? Why are you doing this too? And then I hear something like that. And it's like, oh, that's why, because like, in the long run it actually does sell more books and it does bolster your career and it makes people feel connected to you in a way they maybe won't if they just you know picked up a random piece of fiction yeah how did you come to podcasting was it that sort of analysis like this would be a boost or what was the driving well I so um I was working at a women's website called The Pool a few years ago and uh, I met two girls there Alex Haddo who's a comedian and Hannah Varrell who's an audio producer and we really made each other laugh and we really wanted to do something just ourselves um, and so it became just this thing that we did we, it was called The School for Dumb Women it's still kind of we still put it out occasionally it has a little quote-unquote cult following <laughs> um, but um, it's just like the three of us like you know talking absolute trash for an hour but it was really fun and it really taught me the basics of podcasting and like you know on how it differs from a normal conversation and you know how to self-edit and all that kind of stuff and um after that I decided on sentimental garbage because I was reading a Marion Keys book called Rachel's Holiday and um, I really was, I really loved it. I was really enjoying it. I love Marion Keyes' work. And after I finished it, I was like, oh, I really want some like meaty discussion of this book. I really want to read like an essay on like Marion Keyes' Walsh sisters versus Little Women, you know, versus the Bennett sisters. Like I wanted to like have this in-depth stuff. And then I realized it wasn't there. And then I, I, I found myself realizing that kind of thing a lot of the time, which is like, there's so much discussion, you know, about, so much literary fiction that's very easy to come by, like whether it's, you know, you know, Zadie Smith or George Saunders or all these like fantastic writers. But there's this other pool of fantastic writing that gets very little magazine space, gets almost no newspaper space, gets no real discussion, despite the fact it is the most widely read genre basically in the world, which is, you know, women's romance and commercial fiction. And I, it was one of those sort of moments where what you want to do and what needs to be done becomes a perfect Venn diagram, you know, it's a perfect circle. I was like, oh, you know, this is, people are going to need this and I'm going to love making it. So I'm really delighted that it paid off, you know? Yeah, that seems like such a, a rarity for that to happen, for the, the thing that you want and the thing that is needed and the thing that you can offer all. Yes, yes, sort of coincide. totally. It happens really rarely. And I remember I tweeted it or something and I was like, oh, I would love a discussion podcast for, for just these kinds of books. And the response was so immediately huge that I like messaged Hannah, who's an audio producer, and I asked her if she would make it with me. And we made the first season together and with the intention that it was going to be a limited series, like 10 episodes, and that would be it. And we, you know, one and done. Um, but then the, the feedback and the response was so immediately great uh, that we, I just knew I had to continue doing it and that it was sort of a, a, like a weird calling in some way. I suppose I was wondering, do you feel like your own work 
has received that same sort of generous, close attention from reviewers that, that you're giving to other books? Oh, what a wonderful question. Um, what I think the difference here is, is that like, I have been, I haven't been publishing that long. I mean, my first book came out in 2018. It's now 2021. Um, and so I, I feel like I've gotten, I've been really, really lucky and that I have had lots of like extremely thoughtful reviews, particularly from the Irish press. Um, I was especially thrilled when Scenes of a Graphic Nature, my second novel, came out. I was so nervous about how that would be received because there is some quite critical stuff in it about Ireland, while also being quite a fun piece of fiction. And like it kind of melds genres together in a way that was very experimental and new for me. And I just got this wave of support and not I, I actually support isn't what's important to me like someone saying they loved something or whatever or just leaving a, a five-star goodreads review and being like yeah I liked it cool like that's that's lovely but like when someone really understands what you're trying to say I mean that's why you write right you write to be understood and when you feel understood it is an incredible feeling even if that understanding comes with criticism However, I think the for me to get the level of uh, you know someone discussing my work the way I discuss other people's work, I think I do need the benefit of time because one of the things I also love about the podcast is that we don't just analyze the book, we analyze the context of the book as well. Um, like you know, a lot of the, this stuff came out in the like mid '80s or early '90s, and when you really drill down into you know what attitudes were at that time, it really has it. It just places it within a really interesting context. So I would like, I really would love in like 20 years time to have like, you know, a 30 year old when I'm 50 being like, oh God, well, of course, you know, 2018 was the year of the blah, you know? So <laughs> I would love that one day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think they'd have a lot of material to work with. Um, the one that I listened to recently is uh, Promising Young Women. And I have to say, I had to fight for the copy <laughs> because, oh, wow. because as soon as we got it into the library, basically all the copies were borrowed. Um, it, it's That's great. It's very, it's very yeah. popular. But I say that, um, that there's plenty to work with just because you've got so many layers built into Promising Young Women mm. that allow it to really explore and examine um women's desires and internal life and i was just noticing how besides a very self-aware first person narrator you've also got her um her job in in marketing which is trying to exploit women's yeah. um, <laughs> vulnerabilities and their their fantasies and guilt trips and mm. and then you've got her moonlighting as an agony aunt as well where she also gets yeah. to analyze the underlying emotions and desires and whatever um I mean because these feel like very intentional choices to allow you to do that I kind of wondered were there other occupations that you considered for Jane oh um, wow that's so interesting first of all thank you so much for that that read and that and that lovely compliment because you came out three years ago now and um yeah, it's been a long time since anyone sort of talked to me about it directly. And it's just really lovely to hear. Um, because obviously, you know, it came out in 2018, I sort of finished writing it in 2016. So it feels like even further away. And I was even younger then. And, and now it just feels like quite embarrassing or something. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the thing with, and this is something I actually tell all people who want to write fiction or novels or whatever, and don't know where to start is you take something that you know really well and then you sort of change it and keep changing it and pretty soon it'll be an entirely different thing. I think a lot of women especially, they're afraid of being accused of being working autobiographically because you know that's the thing that like everyone dismisses female art as being, right? So I, I meet a lot of young girls and they're like, oh, I've, um, you know, I'm going to, like set my novel during the you know Al Albanian genocide or something and it's like well do you do you really know that much about that or are you just sort of looking to be extremely serious and to be taken seriously um and so what I always recommend is just sort of go go back to the beginning go back to what you really really know well and just keep tweaking as you go and what I really knew well was the world of marketing um I had worked 
in a large advertising agency for three years and a kind of smaller agency before that. And I found it a really interesting job because it's populated by people who sort of commend themselves on how well they read humanity, right? That's what marketing is. It's a lot of people coming into rooms being like, well, what's a mom in Berkshire going to do with that kind of thing? And they sort of, they invent, it's like almost a form of novel writing of itself, marketing, because it's like they invent these people for you to sell to who don't exist, but who are supposed to be facsimiles of people who do exist. And, um, you know, it's like a lot of like 45-year-old men pretending like they know what a 31-year-old first-time mother knows, thinks about her kid or whatever. And, um, so it's always interesting when people who think that they're very aware of humanity have almost no self-awareness themselves. And that's always like, that's just so fun to play with. And that's why those scenes in Promising Young Women, particularly when she's at work and she's in these big meetings, were so much fun to write because it felt like I was exercising all these thoughts I'd had over years. And I really wasn't that concerned over whether or not it was going to be too autobiographical or whatever. Um, because I was changing and tweaking so much as I was going and I had built this kind of magical realism plot into it where sort of Jane sort of loses her kind of grip on her sanity. And yeah, and that's, and so no, in answer to your original question, which I've just remembered, <laughs> um, I, I, there was never going to be another job for her because that was the job I had in my 20s. And, you know, that's, that's it really. <laughs> You're listening to the Listening Books Podcast. Coming up, we're going to dive a little deeper into plot details of Carolyn's book, Promising Young Women. If you want to avoid any hint of spoilers, you can skip ahead about eight minutes to land safely in spoiler-free territory. If you're enjoying this conversation, one thing you can do to help others find us is leave a review on our Podchaser page. That's podchaser.com forward slash listening books, which I've linked to in the show notes. The ending, which I won't say too much about because obviously spoilers, um, but it surprised me. Um, it went mm. in a less overtly triumphant way than I was expecting, um, okay. where it seemed less about winning and more about still standing. The resilience of Jane seemed to be the point rather than the typical sort of downfall of the big mm. bad man. Um, yeah. and I, um, I both appreciated that and wondered if you were ever tempted to go down the more obvious route. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad that you said that because the, the weirdest thing about Promising a Woman coming out, and I should say, just in case people are confused, there is a movie by the same name, but there is nothing, it has nothing to do with this book. Oh. Um, yeah, there's like a movie out right now called Promising Young Women. It stars Carrie Mulligan. It's, um, How dare they? <laughs> I know it's deeply annoying because people leave reviews for my book saying this isn't the movie. And I'm like, I, I know, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no. So the, the strangest thing about it coming out was that it came out in, in June 2018 and a couple of months previous, maybe maybe less than a month. I can't quite remember the timeline. Um, the Me Too movement happened. And um, it, it, it sort of became this moment, this sort of summer, I think that every woman is going to, of our generation, is going to remember probably for as long as we live, where it was like everything, everything changed, but also nothing changed. It was this thing of like, well, this man, you know, the, it was like this, this huge statue that was like Harvey Weinstein was pulled down in the town square. And then all these smaller statues got pulled down as well. It was all these people that were being um, revealed as, as sort of, abusers and not just people who'd abused women but who had silenced them as well by you know these these non-disclosure agreements all these things all this infrastructure that was there to protect these men and you see the weird thing is, is that even though I had written this book by the time that it all happened you see that in Promising Young Women as well you see um so Jane's boss Clem sort of has a romantic relationship with her and then Although the relationship is totally consensual when it begins, it becomes this sort of like closing cage of lack of options for her within her workspace. And it's this thing of like, there's this entire infrastructure that's there to protect him. Like, there's a scene in it where they're both called into HR because, you know, this kind of relationship is non 
is against the sort of policy of the agency they work at. And they say to Jane, like, you know, we're going to have to give you disciplinary hearing about this. Um, but also because we recently gave you a promotion, you're still technically on like parole. So um, we're going to have to suspend you. And and it's like this sort of drilled. And she's like, what? Like, And and then meanwhile, he literally says, like, I'm going to come get and get my disciplinary later. And then he walks out, of, like, walks out of the room. It is the most infuriating moment in fiction I've experienced in some time, I have to say. It was, <laughs> I was so indignant listening to it. And yet it was all... Um, so very believable. And the entrapment as well by HR into getting her to, into, yeah. you know, pretending to be her friend and to, to get her to admit to this. And it's really... Yeah, and it, and it's this thing of... And I remember I had a, co- a conversation with my editor when that I turned in that scene. And she was like, you know, maybe we need the stakes to be a bit higher. What if they fired Jane? What if this? What if that? And I was like, no, it has to be a suspension because A of all, she has to be... She has to walk back in which is that that's an even bigger punishment than being fired. You have to walk back in after making a scene, after a week away where everyone's talking about you. And second of all, like, it's not, and this is the, this is the thing with all sort of sexual abuse within workplaces. It's not as if everyone around you is evil. Like, it's just that everyone is following a protocol that was built to not service you you know and that is more frightening that's way scarier um and it's also everybody's doing what's easiest and it's easier to continue along with the status quo and the narrative that has formed itself yeah. it's it's easier just to sort of expel you as the woman who's lost her mind uh than it is to confront this this level of abuse that is actually Going yes, on. yes, exactly. And and to sort of go back to your uh, original question, which I seem to love <laughs> spinning away from, <laughs> um, um, it, this ending where I kind of thought about all these endings whereby like, oh, we got rid of the bad man from the advertising agency and now like, <laughs> now there's a breastfeeding office. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it, whenever I try to write those scenes, they never flowed naturally because I never, I don't, believe they would happen yeah Uh, when I think about that character and where he is now I think like yeah he probably got fired or or no he probably didn't even get fired he probably agreed to leave that agency and then he probably started an agency somewhere else that's like small and edgy and boutique and in East London and the kind of place where people like swear at each other and point at each other a lot and he's probably still doing the exact same thing, you know? And I was like, I don't, I, and actually the more I thought about it and the, the more like bummed out it made me, I was like, you know what? It's not about him or what happens to him. It's not about what happens at agency. It's about this woman realizing that she doesn't want to be in this system anymore and that there are other options and there are other things for her to do. And so that's why it ends the way that it does. I like the ending and it felt like a real ending. And it also reminded me, of the difference that um, the older woman who's more senior in the agency. Oh, Deb, yeah. Deb, sorry. Deb sort of draws a distinction between Clem's kind of mentality, like where the emphasis is on winning. It's just short-term wins that he's focused on. Yeah. Um, And she's there for the long term when things get difficult, you know, managing the relationships with the clients or whatever. And so she completely dismisses him because it's so short-sighted to look at it at just that win. And so the, the ending kind of reminded me of that because oh, that's her, such a great point. Because her triumph is is not just the short-term win over him. Her her triumph is the long-term resilience. Yeah, no, I, I totally I agree with you. And I'd never thought of it in that context before, but you're totally right. And um yeah, and what I love about Deb is that like when Jane goes to Deb and like, you know, he's trying to He's, you know, trying to steal your job. He's trying to wreck your career. He's undermining you at work. Like, do you know this? And like, Deb is like, duh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, duh. (laughs) Like, of course he is. Like, you don't get to 50 and be the head of a department without knowing that men are undermining you and trying to take your job. (laughs) Like, wake up, smell the coffee. (laughs) Thank you so much for revisiting uh, Promising Young Women. I really enjoyed it. I I just haven't thought about it in a while. So I'm really glad to be thinking about it again. 
Well, you mentioned that it, it felt a little embarrassing because that, that was the first one and it was a, a while ago. Yeah. Um, well, I know scenes of graphic nature, you're playing with different genres as well. There's mm-hmm. a bit of a murder mystery in there. But mm-hmm. is there something you feel like you you really brought to scenes of a graphic nature that, that you learned from your first experience, from your first novel or that you... Yeah. God, that's a great, that's a really great... Well, you're a wonderful interviewer, by the way. I, I you're think so are great questions. Kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yes, yeah, I do think there were a lot of like lessons learned from between book one and book two. Uh, and particularly, I think I, I realized that I'm someone who really loves borrowing from from genre in order to, I think the, the main thing I've, re- I've discovered about how I like to work is that I like things to look like how they feel like. So Promising Young Women um, has a lot of the same shapes as Gothic literature does. Um, it sort of has a, it's vaguely similar to Jane Eyre in a way, like that's, a re- that's kind of why she's called Jane. Um, because, you know, if you think about Jane Eyre, it's, it's a, it's a workplace relationship, you know, it's like, yeah. she's, you know, and he, you know, she's this, this person that goes into this like infrastructure that he completely runs. He's already destroyed a woman before her, like, and it's sort of, she's got really very limited options. And and I, and that's why that the imagery sort of borrows from Gothic literature so much. And then similarly with scenes of a graphic nature, I as as an Irish person who has been away from my home country for I mean this year it'll be ten years. Um, I wanted it to look like how it feels like, and how it feels to be Irish sometimes is that you are in a murder mystery, and it's. <laughs> Oh, say more about that. (laughs) Um, It feels like the thing about being Irish is that every six weeks to three months, something horrible comes out in the paper and you open your email from the Irish Times that you get every morning and it says, you know, um, Bishop, you know, responsible for the cover up of the death of 13 children or something or or something like that the the big one that is referenced in scenes of graphic nature several times is Tomb, which is a a, yeah. a place in Galway where uh there was a mother and baby home where basically a mass grave of children's remains were found near it and um the weirdest thing about it was that the grave the grave was discovered in the 70s and the police looked into it and I think they told local people that um it was a mass grave left over from the famine and people built a shrine to it and people like you know pray to it and stuff and people wanted to remember but they were remembering the wrong people wanted to honor the dead but they were honoring the wrong dead mm-hmm. and it, and for the wrong reasons and I was really arrested by this image of like we're so caked in all this trauma left over by both the British Empire and the Catholic Church and because we're so alienated from our own paperwork, like like even like recently a huge report, a really groundbreaking report happened over the church abuses in Ireland. And it's so sad because it took us so long to wrestle this data from the church. And now most of those women are dead, like the women who mm. were imprisoned in these laundries. And that's why the sort of shape of a murder mystery was so important to me. It's because like, Sometimes it does feel like you're in a house that's covered in blood and you don't know where the murderer is and all you have is like these chalk imprints on the floor. And so I learned from Promising Young Women that like you can borrow these things from genre and because everyone understands genre, because it's all, these tropes have existed within our like cultural narrative for hundreds of years. And so you can use these things like, like the, you know, like the smoking gun, like, you know, the, the Gothic house and you can use them to make bigger points about your art. And I realized that's something I, I love doing. Now, uh, you shifted genres again with your latest book, mm. All Our Hidden Gifts. And yes. uh, now it's supernatural and it's uh, young adult or teen fiction. Yeah. Um, what was that like to, to switch into that genre? Well, do you know what's interesting, actually? Because I just mentioned that, you know, with, with Promising Young Women, it was a nod to gothic literature. Uh, with Scenes of Graphic Nature, it's a nod to you know, murder mysteries, but with the, both those genres, I don't know a ton about them. <laughs> like, and that's what's embarrassing. Like I, I've read like the big Gothic novels, like Rebecca, Jane Eyre, mm-hmm. but like I, 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 
I'm not like a scholar in those things. Like I'm not, so I'm sort of, you know, it's, it's not that authentic or, or it's not coming from that deep uh, well of knowledge. And same with scenes of a graphic nature. It's like, I actually don't read murder mysteries because I, it's like maths for your brain. So for, for, <laughs> it's like narrative maths where it's like, okay, well, the, the butler was here and the thing was here and the rectory only has two doors. And it's, like, <laughs> and it's really confusing and I'm like quite dumb. Like I, I don't have a very good logic brain. So, um, so Do you I, feel like you need to solve it before the author does, before it's revealed? No, it's not even that. It's not even like, I don't even have that level of God complex. It's more that like, I can't, I literally, when someone when you know Poirot or whatever reveals that like oh and so and so had stains on his shoes I'm like <laughs> did we know that <laughs> yeah, did we did we know that already <laughs> I don't know it's like yeah um, I'm terrible about that as well actually I can't keep track of those kind of details but the way that I try to solve it is by looking at what I think the author is trying to do like where they're trying to like point me in a different direction yeah like I'm yeah. trying to guess second guess the author more than I'm trying to keep up with the clues I think <laughs> no very that yeah I completely agree um so so yeah so the, with those two genres like despite the fact that I was playing with them I don't actually have very deep knowledge of them but with um all our hidden gifts I'm actually a huge fan of young adult supernatural fiction it's probably one of my favorite genres to read um because I like particularly stuff that came out in like the late 80s and early 90s like Margaret Mayhe and Diana Wynne Jones this sort of really like complex sort of spooky haunted narratives that generally have a huge amount to say about particularly the ones that deal with witchcraft sort of female development and female the sort of the inherent witchiness of being born a girl of like you know, the, like there's nothing witchier than bleeding for five days and not dying. You know, like it's it's amazing. Um, and, you know, and with more modern stuff as well, uh, Lee Bardugo, I'm a huge fan of. I'm a huge fan of Sarah J. Mass and Naomi Novik. There's a lot of, there's such good work in this area. But what I wanted to specifically play with for All Our Hidden Gifts in the same way I did with Scenes and with Promising is that, you know, when you're, when you're a teenage girl and you fall out with your best friend, it, it feels like the end of the world. Yeah. And in this book, it is kind of thing. It's so these two girls, um, our main character is Maeve Chambers and she's a teenager and she is done that thing that either so many teenage girls have done or have had done to them where they dump their best friend from primary school because they have an opportunity to ascend the ranks of popularity, but their friend is kind of dead weight on that goal. And mm -hmm. so she cuts off her friend. She cuts off the only person who's ever really understood or loved her. And then there's like this horrible year where they don't speak. And we meet Maeve at the end of this year and we feel this loneliness radiating off of her. And uh, she's done these horrible things to her friend that she can't undo. And then she finds these tarot cards within her school and she gets really good at them. And she's, you know, t she's telling everyone's, cards and like every she kind of has that I don't know if you've been to you've gone to a girl's school but like girl's school love fads and like just kind of you know things that just you know make you popular for three days oh, yeah. and towards the end of this fad all the girls in her class are like you know who hasn't had a reading yet your ex-best friend who you were mean to and we all know about that kind of thing <laughs> and so she gives her friend a reading this sort of horrible traumatic thing happens during that reading and then Lily quickly goes missing. And not only does Lily go missing, but Maeve has sort of unintentionally like torn a hole in the fabric of the magical lining of the world. Oh, wow. And it invites... Those are some high stakes. <laughs> they some high stakes, yeah. And it invites all this other um, sort of... These people who kind of prey on magic and prey on weakness um, it summons them to this place where they live and that that becomes sort of the narrative arc of the series um, so yeah sometimes sometimes when you fight with your best friend it is the end of the world <laughs> wow and it is a series it's not a standalone it is yeah I just yeah. I'm finishing the sequel right now um, oh. and I'm hoping there will be three books in the series do you have much of a hand um, in the casting of the audiobooks for, of, of your own yeah titles? surprisingly yes I think because I'm a huge audiobook fan um, I was from the beginning, I was very like, okay, I'm, I, by the way, I'm, this is not going to be something I'm going to sit still for. I'm going to have a big say in this. 
Um, and so I've had the really amazing opportunity with both Promising and Scenes. Promising was actually narrated by a friend, Tessa Coates, um, which was great because I literally, she, I mean, she's, she's an actress anyway, and, and she's a podcaster um, and a writer. And she was just in my house one day. I was cooking her dinner and the paperback for Promising came in the post and she started reading it to me while I was cooking. And it, I remember this feeling. I was like, oh, this is the first time I've oh. liked this book since I wrote it, <laughs> you know? Oh. And I was like, you have to do it. You have to do it. And so I, I immediately got on to the producers and I was like, she's, a, she's an actress. So can you, can we get her in? Make this happen. <laughs> can we make this happen? Yeah. And, um, and, and it's, she did an amazing job and, you know, she, I, I hope she gets more audiobook work through it because she's so good at it. Um, and yeah. it's weird. It's so weird as well because when I was listening to it back, and like, there's a couple of sex scenes in Promising, and she sort of does his voice, and I'm like, it's so weird being like, okay, I find this weirdly hot, even though it's <laughs> it's my friend reading my work. It's so weird. <laughs> um, and then for scenes, I basically did the same thing again, where um, my friend Esther O'Mor Donahue, she was also a voice actor, and she um, she does radio in Ireland as well she she did the voice for that so it was yeah in both in both instances I got to choose ah uh, yeah that's great yeah yeah it's really great I love it and have you have you ever undertaken a reading challenge you know these reading no, challenges that don't go care around? for them no don't care for them <laughs> <laughs> no I don't like it I find it very stressful um yeah, and I and I but I, I do use Goodreads. Um, like yeah. I, I I like you know reviewing books as in when I I read them, um, and I it really stresses me out to see all these people who are like book thirty nine of fifty oh. and it, I I don't know I, I'm sure they're getting something out of it but it's just not like I I go through phases where I read you know three books in a month and then I might not read for two months and like the mm. idea of like being that regimented frightens me. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, I'm with you on that actually, and I've never done one of the numbered ones. Like I've, yeah, I never set a, I never set a number for the year and try to reach it because yeah, I'm always afraid that that's just going to encourage me to read just shorter books so I can reach the number yeah, quicker. Yeah, totally. you know? no, you know, you're completely right. I remember when I was a kid and we had this like it was like a re a readathon thing and we were like raising money. We had to be sponsored about how many books we would read and we were raising money for MS or something. And uh, I remember cheating the system, but I was, like, I was like 12 and I was reading loads of books that were eight and up. And I remember <laughs> one of my neighbors who was a school teacher looking at the list of books I've read and she just looked at me and she went, come on. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was, I was the opposite. I think I was, um, I would try to read like um, Tale of Two Cities. I tried to read like a Dickens book when I was like wow. nine and it was way above my reading level. I was not comprehending it yeah. like you would want to. Um, but basically I was lobbying the teacher to count it as multiple books because it was... I know. agree. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but um, in terms of the reading challenges thing, I do think... I, I'm sorry, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm being very dismissive. I think yeah, those no. those things where it's like, you know, a volume of books, I'm like, I don't really know how helpful that is. But when it's like people who are making an effort to read from non-white authors or from yeah. or lo love stories that aren't straight love stories or basically any kind of um, fiction that is not as read as it should be because of the infrastructure of publishing and bookshops and what or whatever, they don't get the publicity they should. And I think those are great. Good. Um, because as you know, Listening Books has an audiobook listening challenge we're running this year. We're running it a little bit different than we did last year, where I think it was a challenge per month. And this one is a bit more, it, it allows a bit more flexibility. So we've got sort of 10 uh, main challenges and then a few turbo challenges in addition for the people who really want to up their game. But it really is just about uh, encouraging people in a playful way to read more widely and more diversely. So one of the items in our listening challenge this year is to read not just a romance, but a book featuring an LGBTQ plus romance. Um, and I feel like you have a pretty good like survey of the romance yeah. um, genre. So I wonder, do you have any recommendations for this challenge? Oh, tons. Yeah. Um, I Okay. There's one book that's come out recently. I don't know whether we would call it squarely a romance, but it's definitely about romantic relationships mm -hmm. um called detransition baby by tori peters 
oh, it's it's so it's so fantastic. It's basically about this um uh, this trans woman, this uh, this man who's recently detransitioned. So he used to be a trans woman, and now he's decided to live as a man, and his cisgendered girlfriend. Sorry, it, 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 it's much you know. It's not actually as confusing as I'm making it sound. Um, and uh, basically he gets his cisgendered girlfriend pregnant and then they want to raise the baby with his trans ex-girlfriend who's the the main character and basically it's this like amazing book about relationships and motherhood and looking at mothering in a new way and and it's just it's an incredible it really like blows up the binary in terms of what we think that relationship dramas should be so that's one um, another one that I love, and everybody read this because it won the Pulitzer, uh, is Less by Andrew Sean Greer, mm. uh, which I think is just a stunning, gorgeous book. It's so funny. If people love like Muriel Spark, it's like written in a very similar style to that. Like it's very short, but it's very dense and very funny. Um, what are more of them? Have you read uh, Paul, Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl? No, I haven't. Yeah, by um, yeah, Andrea Lawler. Paul takes the form of a mortal girl by Andrea Lawler, um, and it's about this boy Paul who's a shapeshifter, and he can sh- he can shift and, and look any way that he wants, and um, falls in love with a lesbian girl, and uh, you know he can he can sort of change his shape into a woman's shape for periods of time, but he can't do it for very long, and it's you know, it's just a, a wonderful look at gender and and yeah, our shifting perspectives on it. I love yeah. the sound of that. Yeah, yeah. They, they're they're all like fantastic books, and uh, yeah, I really recommend any one of them. Uh, the Less by Andrew Sean Greer is the only one that I have on audiobook, so that's the only one I can definitely confirm. It's a great listen. Oh, also, okay. sorry, I got another one. That's okay. uh, <laughs> um, Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. Oh, yes, yeah. Lo- that. So I I really really love and respect Sarah Waters, but mm. I cannot read her books because they are big and heavy. Um, <laughs> um and i have very weak wrists uh so i i listen to all of her stuff on audiobook and fingersmith is my favorite um i don't think i've listened to any of them i've i've read a couple of them mm. um but yeah love her love her work yeah that's a good shout um we also have as i mentioned we have some turbo level challenges and one of them is to listen to an audiobook from your least favorite genre uh, mm-hmm. which I do find quite challenging, actually. Um, mm-hmm. I think for some people, um, so-called chick lit um, yeah. falls into that category. And I just wonder, as a, as a champion of, of chick lit, yeah. if you might have some gateway recommendations for skeptics. Sure. Um, so, okay, Circle of Friends is one of my favorite books of all time by Maeve Binchy. Um, and I think, like, if anyone... Like people who read, like if you read Normal People or whatever, or sort of Sayuri, this is um this is the ur text for that. I think it's like this incredibly deep and beautiful exploration of just like these fr- this friends going to college in Dublin and all of the sort of the various sort of class collisions and love stories within that. And I just think it is one of the most beautiful books of all time, and everyone should read it. Wow. Um. So so if you're a person who normally loves a kind of literary fiction sort of thing like Sally Rooney uh I would really recommend that book you're such a good book matchmaker I love how you're like (laughs) thinking specifically of the (laughs) thank you I think about books always so I um I'm, I'm I love doing it um I then okay if people are like quite into sort of if their guilty pleasure tends to be more celebrity based like you know looking at celebrities' Instagrams, uh, I would really recommend Who's That Girl by Vary McFarlane um, because it is about a, it's a, a really, really fun romantic comedy about a woman who has to write, like ghost write a celebrity memoir and falls in love with celebrity. And he's like a Kit Harrington type. And it's like, it's really, really funny. It's got some really funny things to say about celebrity and about that kind of um, celebrity profile writing that everybody hates, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, I, I really love that book. Thank you so much for such thoughtful recommendations and thoughtful answers. And um, you've been such great company. I'm, oh, thank which, you. You I too, really you too. this has been a lovely morning. It's a lovely way to spend a Friday morning. 
Carolyn O'Donoghue's books Promising Young Women and Scenes of a Graphic Nature are both available as audiobooks to borrow in the Listening Books Library, and we're looking forward to the release of All Our Hidden Gifts in May. You can hear more from Carolyn on her podcast Sentimental Garbage, and I'll be back next month with acclaimed actor and audiobook narrator Kovna Holbrook-Smith. You won't want to miss that, so make sure you're subscribed to the Listening Books podcast through your favourite podcast player, and it'll be waiting for you as soon as it's published. Don't forget to leave a review on podchaser.com forward slash listening books, and you can also find us on Twitter at Listening Books. We'd love to hear from you. The Listening Books podcast is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity that provides an audiobook library service for over 115,000 members who find that an illness, mental health issue, physical or learning disability affects their ability to read the printed word or hold a book. It's simple to join. For more information, head to our website, www.listening-books.org.uk.